Okay, so can I start? So the topic of this course is algebraic geometry. Um, so, so here one studies solutions of uh, algebraic equations, so solutions of equations given by polynomials. So, so in algebraic geometry, study, say, zero sets uh, of uh, sets of polynomials. In, so, for instance, uh, one thing that everybody knows, if I take the, the circle as one, is just the set of all points, say, x, y in R2, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to one. So this is the set of zeros of the polynomial x squared plus y squared minus one over the real numbers. And you know that this uh, somehow looks like a circle. So, um, you know, once you study such zero sets, you can uh, consider them over different fields. So, arithmetic algebraic geometry which is part of number theory, studies such solution sets over the rational numbers. So, studies such zero sets over Q. So one equation that essentially everybody will know is you can look at the equation x squared, x to the n, plus y to the n is equal to z to the n. And uh, everybody, so you can, for instance, study this over q. So you know that, uh, or over z, uh, you know that if n is equal to 2, there are many solutions. Because you just have to make a, a triangle with a right angle here. And the length here is x, the length here is y, then the length here will be z by the uh, theorem of Pythagoras. But if n is bigger than, than 2, then uh, Fermat's last theorem that there are no non trivial solutions. So if uh, so x to the n plus y to the n is equal to z to the n implies that x is equal to 0 or y is to equal to 0 if x and y and z are supposed to be rational numbers. And that's uh, one of the most difficult theorems in number theory, which was only recently proven after uh, 300 years. So, <clears throat> but, so, Somehow one sees that there are that things are more, more difficult if the field is kind of small, like the rational numbers, because you have to solve equations, uh, <coughs> algebraic equations over some small field. But you know, you know from uh, algebra that uh, you can always find solutions if the field is algebraically closed. And so in order to really just do geometry and not be concerned with these extra difficulties, we will work only over algebraically closed fields. So with this, we understand the geometry. And then if one understands that, one can maybe go to these more difficult questions. So we work over k equal to gay bar an algebraically closed field. And uh, if you wish, you can assume 
that k is just the complex numbers, but that is not relevant. So just to make sure uh, we know we talk about the same things, I want to briefly recall something, you know, some concepts of algebra. I mean, I expect you have, you know them, but just for five minutes say, uh, for instance, what polynomial in several variables is, so that we use the same words. So preliminaries. So, uh, so for, for us, a ring is a commutative ring with one. If we want to consider other rings, we don't, uh, we will say it. And uh, if uh, phi from A to B is a ring homomorphism, then it follows, then this, this includes also the statement that phi of one is equal to one. Now, briefly about polynomials. So we'll, I mean, you have had polynomials before, obviously, I just repeat some words. So kx, or say rx, or r a ring, then Rx is the ring of polynomials in X with coefficients in R. And these are just um, expressions sum I equals zero to D a i x to the i, where a i is an element in R. And such things are considered equal if the a i are equal. So the, <coughs> the sum and product are defined in the obvious way. No, so you sum them coefficient-wise to multiply them out using the distributive law and xi times xj is x to the i plus j, so as you know. And um, <clears throat> so I just want to say the degree of um, of this polynomial is the largest d such that a d is not zero and a d then is the leading coefficient. Of f. So we will most be concerned with polynomials in several variables you know, as here. So I just have a R inductively define R of x1 to xn to be, we take, uh, we assume we already have defined the polynomial ring in n minus one variables, which is now a ring. And so then we can take the polynomial ring in another variable, xn. This will uh, define it. And uh, so you can see from that that the elements in this ring are uh, expressions f. Uh, sum i1 i n a i1 i n x1 to the i1 times x n to the i n where the um, so i1 to i n are elements in 
are positive integers, non-negative integers. Um, these, uh, the coefficients a1 to a n are on, on definitely many non-zero. Zero. And then this is the, again a ring in the obvious way by adding coefficients and multiplying them out by the distributive law. So, <clears throat> okay, so I expect you know what this is, but uh, you know, just uh, so we have this on the blackboard, and now we want to actually start uh, with the subject of the course. <clears throat> So we want to do algebraic geometry. We talk about algebraic varieties, or first, yeah, algebraic varieties. And uh, the first thing we talk about in it is uh, a fine algebraic sets. So these are the things I just talked about. These are zero sets of sets of polynomials. So, in k to the n. So let's uh, start slowly. Uh, so first, uh, it's a bit, anyway, so I define the n-dimensional affine space is uh, a n which is just crazily enough, in other words, for k to the n. So for some reason in algebraic geometry, the n-fold product of our ground field is called a n. Okay? That's the way life is. There are some reasons for it, but we will not find out about the reasons in this course. <clears throat> and partially it has only historical reasons. But anyway, that's how this thing is called in algebraic geometry. So, uh, so if you have a polynomial, if, if f in k x1 to xn is a polynomial in n variables, the same n as here, uh, this defines as a function on a n. which are also called f from a n to k in the obvious way. If I have a point p, which has coordinates a1 to a n, then I send this to the polynomial evaluated at these coordinates. So polynomials define functions, and therefore we can talk about zeros. So, f of p. So now we want to talk about these affine algebraic sets, which I said are zero sets of sets of polynomials. So let S be a set of polynomials in n variables. So the zero set of S. will be denoted z of s. And uh, by definition, it's the set of all points in an where all the polynomials in s vanish. So this is the set of all points p in an, such that f of p is equal to 0 for all f in s. OK, so this is the obvious definition. And this will be a subset of an, obviously. So, and subsets, sets of this form are called affine algebraic sets. And for why we want to talk about such zero sets. For notation, if we have a finite set, so the zero set of a finite set f1 to 
fk of polynomials, you also just write z of f1 to fk. So one can easily can write some examples. For instance, so for instance, a n is uh, such an affine algebraic set because it's a zero set of the polynomial zero. Or it is also the zero set of the empty set of polynomials. Okay. Then, uh, so we have this trivial case, and we have also have another trivial case. The empty set is the zero set of the constant polynomial one. Or, if you want, it's also the zero set of set of all polynomials. I mean, it's always the common zero set. No. So, as if already for one, you don't get any zero. You go get it there. So here we <coughs> see the most trivial examples of a fine algebraic sets. At least the whole of an and the empty set are fine algebraic sets. Then also a point will be in a fine algebraic set. So if um, so, let uh, P be a point with coordinates a1 to an, an. Well, then obviously P, I mean as a set P is the zero set of not one polynomial, but of several polynomials. Then we can just take x1 minus a1, xn minus an. Because this will be the set of all points in an, such that the first coordinate is a1, and so on, and the nth coordinate is an. So it just is the point a1 to an. So then uh, say if f is a polynomial in two variables, usually if I have not so many variables, I call them x, y, z. Only if I have many, I call them x1 to xn. Is a polynomial in two variables like that, which is not constant. Uh, then uh, we call the zero set of f is called an affine plane curve. And uh, we can look at some examples. For instance, uh, if I take z of y minus x squared, this is a conic or parabola, but anyway, conic. So if we look for a moment to make a you know, if I make pictures, I only take the real points over the real numbers because I cannot make a picture of the complex points because it would be something two-dimensional in a four-dimensional space, real. So the, this would look, the real points look like this. No, it's just a parabola. This would be zero, this is y, this is x, like you have seen it in school. And then you can have z something more complicated. You can have some points which look different from others. And look at this. This is called a cuspidal cubic. If you look at the real points, you can, um, so now I do like this. So you'll find that it somehow, real points somehow look like this. I don't know whether I can do it well. There's some kind of, well, it's symmetric, but it's, it doesn't look very symmetric, but anyway, this is y, this is x. And here there is some, well, something, some point, so the cusp. And you know, this is just the axis, maybe. And uh, we can also, another example would be z of y squared minus uh, x to the three plus x squared. This would be a nodal cubic. Um, 
if you want to make a picture. So then you find that uh, this again y this x, so you find that it somehow looks like this. Well, no, not at all. You see that um, there are some special points here, this thing which is called the cusp, here this thing which is called the node, which uh, are called singularities of the curve. We will talk about such things uh, at the end of the course. And similarly, so here we had talk about plane curves, which are the zero sets of one polynomial in uh, A2. So in the same way, if uh, f is a polynomial in n variables, which is not constant, then the zero set of f uh, will be called a hypersurface. So we want to study these things. <coughs> there are a uh, number of things that one can talk about. So uh, <coughs> you know, there, we will find out there's a, later we will find out there's a concept of dimension in such a way that uh, this affine n space has dimension n and the hypersurface has dimension n minus 1. But it is actually surprisingly uh, complicated to do this in the algebraic way. And you can talk about tangent space and smoothness and singularities. But first we talk about more basic things. And uh, <clears throat> so the first thing that we want to do as we are doing algebraic geometry, we want to somehow get a little bit closer the relation to algebra. So until now, we have that... Uh, uh, an affine algebraic set is a zero set of a set of polynomials. And now we want to say that uh, it is in fact a zero set of an ideal in the polynomial ring, which somehow allows us to use a bit more algebra to work with things. So the first uh, tiny thing we want to, sh to show is that every affine algebraic set is the zero set for I an idea. So this is actually very simple. Let's just do it. So it's just we start with some obvious observations. So if S and T are some subsets, so some sets of polynomials, so if S is contained in T, do you want to? Yeah. If S is contained in T, then it follows that the zero set of S contains the zero set of T. And I should say, you, sh you know, this is completely obvious. Because here you look at all the points where all the polynomials in S vanish. And here, instead here, you look at all the points where all the polynomials in T vanish. But there are, you know, there are more polynomials in T than there are in S. So if all the polynomials in T vanish, then in particular all of them in S vanish, so we have this inclusion. So it's a complete trivialty. Anyway, you can... Now, the other one, uh, and now we come to observing that this is also about as obvious. So if we take the zero set of S, where S is some set of polynomials, then this is equal to the zero set of the ideal generated by S. So if you remember, this would be the set, this is the set of all sum i equals 1 to n fi 
SI, where you know, n is some positive integer, then uh, the fi are some polynomials. So the ID generated by s in kx1 to xn, obviously. And uh, the si are elements in s. So the ideal generated by s consists of all linear combinations with coefficients in the ring uh, of elements in s. And uh, so from this statement, we get what I just said, that every affine algebraic set is the zero set of an ideal. Because by definition, it's the zero set of some set of polynomials, and then it's the zero set of the ideal generated by that set of polynomials. OK, so let's do this little observation. <coughs> So we have to prove both uh, inclusions. So, so we have to, it's clear that the zero set of the ideal generated by S is contained by the zero set of S because S is contained in the ideal generated by S, and we use the first part. Yes. So um, now the other inclusion, conversely. Oh, we have to remember that we talk about zeros. So if P, so let P be an element in the zero set of S. And we take any element G The ele ele any element in the ideal generated by S, so we can write it as sum i, well, m, shouldn't call this n because some number, um, say hi, si, an element in S. So that means that the hi are some polynomials and SI are elements in S. Well, what is G of P? Well, you know, you just, you know, how do you do it? You evaluate it by evaluating these. So this is sum I equals one to N, HI of P, SI of P. And, you know, the SI all vanish at P. So this is zero. Okay, so as you see, this is also trivial. Okay, so much to this, <laughs> but we keep in mind that uh, we have that every defined algebraic set is the zero set of an ideal, and we are going to use this quite a lot in the future. But now we want to look at something different, which is the Zariski topology. This is a slightly strange thing. So we want to, to say, we have these affine algebraic sets, the zero sets of these polynomials. Now we say that these are the closed sets of a topology on AN. So we define a topology on AN whose closed sets are the affine algebraic sets. So, <clears throat> And then it means if we have any affine algebraic set, we can give it the induced topology. So the closed sets of an affine algebraic set are the intersections of this affine algebraic set with another affine algebraic set. So that means now all our affine algebraic sets become topological spaces. Mm. And this is mostly done for convenience of language. So it's kind of convenient to talk about continuous functions, about closed sets, about the closure, and so on. We will see that. But there's one thing that you have to keep in mind. This topology is very strange. It's uh, extremely different. For instance, if you are over the complex numbers, it's very different from the standard Euclidean topology. So the closed sets are very large, uh, are very small. The open sets are very large. 
and you know, you, things are not housed off or anything like that. But all the same, it's a convenient language, but you should never think that we are going to do some interesting topology. It's mostly just language. So we use this, we find it convenient to say, you know, this is a continuous map because it's a practical thing. But we are not going to find out about separation axioms or something like that. You know, this, the, the topology is somehow not interesting or not useful most of the time. But, uh, and you don't have to try to imagine how such a thing looks like in this topology, but you just, it will be a convenient language and we are going to use it in the whole course, so you have to somehow get familiar with it. Okay, and so, <clears throat> so as I said, the, um, the fine algebraic sets are the closed subsets of a topology on the end. And so let's see how this works. <coughs> it's actually very easy to see. Proposition. So if the S alpha, alpha, alpha sum index set, uh, is a family of subsets this one of uh, the polynomial ring, then uh, the intersection over all alpha of the zero set of S alpha is just the zero set of the union over all alpha of S alpha. Okay, the first statement. Now, if you think of it, again, this is completely trivial. Because what does it say? Here you say you take so S alpha is the common zero set of all uh, polynomials F in S alpha. So this thing is the common zero sets of all the Fs which lie in any of the S alpha, which is the same as this. Okay, so basically by, you know, by definition, these are equal. The second statement is, If S and T are some sets of polynomials, then it follows that the zero set of S intersected the zero set of T, no, union, the zero set of T, is the zero set of what I call S times T, by which I mean S times T is a set of all products of elements of S and T. So it's a set of all f times g, where f is in s, g is in t. So this I maybe have to give an argument for, but what you can see is that the first one says that an arbitrary intersection of a fine algebraic set is in a fine algebraic set, and the second one says that the finite union of a fine algebraic set is in a fine algebraic set. It says it here for two, but you know, then you can do induction. So thus, arbitrary intersections and finite unions of a fine algebraic sets are a fine algebraic sets. Okay, so let's, um, yeah. 
let's see. I mean, this is again quite simple. So, proof. Again, the first one already proved. So, uh, so let P be a point in Z of S union Z of T. Well, then it's obvious that it's in Z of S times T because uh, so. Um, so that means that uh, f of p is equal to zero for all. No. So, okay, we take a point here. Now let f be an element of z of s of s, and g be an element of t. Then you know, so then f g is an you know will in this way become an arbitrary element of s times t. You know, if we let this go, so what is f times g of p? Well, this is f of p times g of p by definition. You, know, you evaluate it by doing the product, and s f. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, S P is in Z of S union Z of T. It means that either all for all F in Z of S, F of P is zero, or for all uh, G in P, Z of T is zero. So one of the two must be zero. Is zero. That is follows that this is equal to zero. And now conversely, so P is an element in Z of S times T. Now conversely, we can also uh, do it the other round. We assume that uh, P is an element of Z of S T. We have to show that's in the union of these two. So assume that P does not lie in Z of S. Then we have to show P lies in Z of T. No? So this thing does not lie in Z of S. So let F be a polynomial in S, such that f of p is non-zero. And uh, let g be ele any element now in t. Then f times g is in st. And thus it follows that f times g of p is equal to zero. But this is just equal to f of p times g of p. And this is non-zero. So it follows that g of p is equal to zero because we can you know, divide in the field by this thing. So it follows g of p is equal to zero. Okay, so thus we obtain that, uh, as it follows, that P is in the zero set of T. Okay. So <clears throat> with this, uh, so this proves, as I will recall, that uh, the affine algebraic sets are the closed subsets of a topology on AN. For this, I just for Security will review what this means, and then we, although you have covered it in the topology course, but just very briefly, I will review it. So, uh, reminder. So, so let X be a set. A topology on X is 
is a collection of subsets of X. called open subsets, uh, such that three axioms are fulfilled, such that first um, the empty set and x are both open. Uh, second, uh, arbitrary, well, maybe we should do first, finite intersections of open sets are open. So in other words, so finite intersection of open sets. So if U1 and U2 are open, then U1 intersected U2 are also open. And third, arbitrary, intersect, uh, arbitrary unions of open sets are open. So if uh, I have any set of open sets that just take the union of all of them, then this is again an open set. Okay. Um, slightly less common is that you can, so if you have a topology, you can talk about other things. You, for instance, you can talk about closed subsets. So let, uh, so if X is a, uh, in this case, if X has a topology, it's called a topological space. So if, um, so let, uh, you know, assume we have a topological space. So a subset The A in X is called closed. If the complement is open, so if and only if, I write it maybe like this. Um, X minus A is open in X. Okay, that's the definition. So then, uh, therefore, it is obvious that these axioms for the open subsets translate into axioms for the closed subsets. So, so equivalent axioms for closed subsets. So that the complement is open is equivalent to, uh, so the first one translates into X and the empty set are closed. Uh, the second one is that finite unions of closed subsets are closed because And uh, the last one, uh, union becomes intersection. So because we take the complement, so third arbitrary intersections of closed subsets. Are closed. So I'm pretty sure that you also had this in the topology course. It's one of the first things to notice. And then I want to just introduce the standard words. So, so if X is a topological space, 
we can say that um, the, the closure say u bar of a subset u in x is just the intersection of all closed subsets that contain x. What other words do we want to use? So we say that uh, U is called dense in X if its closure is equal to X. And uh, we want to introduce the induced topology. So that X topological space, Y subset X, Closed sub, uh, no, a subset. So then the induced or subspace topology is given so by saying that U subset Y is open if and only if it's intersection with Y of an open subset in X. W in X open. Oh, that's the subspace topology. And uh, just as a side remark, you can write the same thing for closed subsets. So equivalent to this, that uh, A subset Y is closed if and only if A is equal to B intersected Y with um, B subset or X closed. No, it's again by taking the complement, this is an equivalent statement. And then finally, uh, most important con concept is that of a continuous map. So a map, say f from x to y of topological spaces is continuous if the inverse image of any open subset is open. is open in X for any uh, Y, uh, U in Y, which is open. And again, equivalently, you can do it with closed subsets. F to the minus one of A is closed for any A subset Y closed. Okay, so this is kind of bo boring and you should know it, but you know, just we just want to, I just say that we want to use all the standard words uh, that one uh, learns in the first couple of lectures or so of topology. So now we can go back to our case. So, so this is a risky topology definition. This is a risky topology. On the N is the topology whose closed subsets are the affine algebraic sets. And uh, note that we have seen that this is a topology. So this uh, lemma that we proved said precisely that uh, finite unions and arbitrary intersections of affine algebraic sets are affine algebraic sets. And at the very beginning, I gave these examples which said that the empty set and the whole of An are the fine algebraic sets. 
So all these four, uh, all these three axioms are fulfilled. So this is a topology. Okay. And then if we have a subset of AN, in particular if we have an affine algebraic set, we give it the induced topology. So if X subset AN is a subset, um, we give it the induced topology. Um, so, so that means that, in other words, the closed subsets of X are X intersected A or with A and a fine algebraic set. And so in particular, and this is called, this topology is called the Zariski topology. On X. So the, the name is after Oskar Zariski, some uh, mathematician of uh, Polish origin, who first uh, worked for a long time in Italy and then worked in the US. <coughs> and he invented this topology as a way to uh, make it easier to deal with things. So uh, as a remark, well, whatever. So it's kind of obvious. You should, uh, you should find it obvious that if x, it's, so the most important case is that x is itself in a, a fine algebraic set. And then uh, the Zariski topology on X will be so that the closed subsets of X are the affine algebraic sets contained in X. No? Because the intersection of affine algebraic sets is an affine algebraic set. So let's look at, just to see what this topology is like, let's look at some example. So first, um, we find that all finite subsets of AN are closed. This is because we have seen that uh, a point in AN is in a fine algebraic set, and finite unions of a fine algebraic sets are a fine algebraic sets. So all finite subsets of AN are a fine algebraic sets. And the second statement is, let's look at one uh, simpler case, let me just add A1. So what are the closed subsets uh, uh, what are they? They are the empty set and A1, we know they have to be, and all finite subsets. So what we see here is that there are very few closed subsets. So the topology is uh, very strange. The closed subsets are very small, you know, except for the whole of A1. All other ones are finite. But anyway, that's uh, so you can in particular see that, for instance, the topology is not Hausdorff. Uh, and, uh, but as I said, we are not really doing topology. It's a language. So let's just see this uh, second one, which is not quite as, so the first is obvious, but the second one has to give a small argument. So let uh, um, say I in Kx be an ideal, or just any set of polynomials, but I can say ideal. Then I know that any 
the fine algebraic set is a zero set of an ideal. So either I is the zero ideal, then it follows that uh, the zero set of I is A1. Yes. Um, now assume it's not. So if not, then there exists an F in Kx without zero in I with F is non-zero. And now, you know from uh, algebra that if you have a polynomial in one variable, then it has a finite set of zeros. <coughs> in the, at most, as many as the degree of the polynomial. So then, z of f is finite. And uh, z of i, you know, as f is contained in i, is contained in z of f, is also finite. A subset of a finite set. So it might be finite set or the empty set. And that's uh, what is being claimed here. OK, another. <clears throat> so today I, uh, you know, I don't do anything which is particularly difficult, but I introduce very many concepts. You know? So you have to look and uh, study it a little bit so that you remember everything. But you know, we haven't, uh, and to get used to how these things work, but until now, there has been no argument uh, which is difficult. So um, we introduce one more concept, which is also quite simple. But it's one more, so it gets kind of piled up. So that's the ideal of an algebraic set. Later, we will also work with it, but now we just introduce it. So we know, so, so if um, I is an ideal, then um, its zero set is in a fine algebraic set. Actually, it's true for any set, but anyway, is a fine algebraic set. So we have kind of, uh, in some sense, a map which associates to every ideal its zero set. We want to go the other way around. We want to say if we have an affine algebraic set, we want to associate to it an ideal. So we want to Yeah, why not? And this should somehow. And so the <clears throat> here, the zero set is just a set of all common zeros. And the ideal of an, a fine algebraic set will be just a set of all polynomials which vanish on the whole of this set. So um, let me just write it down. Definition. Once we are at it, we can actually associate an ideal for every subset, but it's mostly interested in it's interesting if the subset is an ideal. So let X in A N the subset. The ideal of uh, X is I X. This is the set of all polynomials which vanish on the whole of x. So I could I just say it like that. If I take f restricted to x, this is the zero map. You know, so it's somehow similar to the other, you know, for the, the zero set is a set of all points where all the f's vanish, and here instead 
we, the ideal is a set of all polynomials which vanish there. Um, and so, just, you know, we are in the moment not going to work with that, but just as a remark, or maybe exercise. Um, first statement is that if you take the zero set of the ideal of x for any subset, this is equal to the closure of x. In particular, if uh, x is an algebraic set, then the zero set of the ideal of x is equal to x. Okay, this follows, I mean, you should be able to do this. This follows more or less directly from the definitions. Um, one inclusion is obvious. For the other one, you maybe have to think a moment. But uh, anyway, so this is just, you can try to do this to check whether you understand what these things are. OK. OK, so until now, I've introduced all these things. And now um, we actually come to our first non-trivial result, so our first theorem, um, the so-called Hilbert basis theorem. Um, I mean, named after uh, David Hilbert, a famous German mathematician, uh, which, uh, <coughs> anyway, so, <coughs> uh, so this is, for us it means something rather simple. Uh, so if you have an affine algebraic set, then we know it's a zero set of some set of polynomials. That's the definition. And the Hilbert basis theorem implies that we can take, always take the set to be finite. Now before, I always had taken your know, S was an arbitrary set of polynomials, but actually we can always take it to be finite. So the Hilbert basis theorem says um, we can take S to be finite. And uh, this by itself, you know, it's nice to know, so we don't have infinite set of polynomials, but it actually turns out that um, this has some geometric consequences. It um, follows, for instance, that every affine algebraic set can be decomposed into finitely many pieces, which somehow cannot be further decomposed. So it is only, so an algebraic set will somehow always look like, like this. And they are not somehow infinitely many pieces, but only finitely many. We will see in a moment what this precisely means. We will not come to this this time. Um, but this is actually a consequence of this statement. So in order to uh, talk about this, I first have to introduce some algebra some commutative algebra. Which I think you did not have in the algebra course, but I'm not sure anyway. So lemma definition. So let R be a ring. And 
then the following are equivalent. First, every ideal in R is finitely generated. So I can write it as the idea generated by finitely many elements. So I is written as f1 to fk for some k, some finite number k, and some elements fi in R. Okay. And the second statement is that whenever I have a chain of ideals, so there's one ideal contained in the next and so on, some infinite chain like that, I1 contained I2 in I3 and so on, and to infinity, then at some point it stops. From some point onwards, all the ideals are equal. This is so-called ascending chain condition. So that is, so if um, E1 contained in E2, contained in E3, and so on, infinitely, is a chain of ideal, chain of ideals. So the next one is always contained in the previous one, and uh, it goes until then. Uh, this chain becomes stationary. By which I mean that from some point on onwards, they are all equal. There exists an N such that I N is equal to i n plus 1, is equal to i n plus 2, and so on. Okay? So if we have kind of ideals which get larger and larger, at some point it must stop. They cannot get larger and lar larger infinitely many times. And these two statements are supposed to be equivalent. And so this is the lemma part, and the definition part is that if a ring fulfills these properties, then it's called Noetherian. Okay, this is after Emmy Noether, some uh, well-known German algebraist who invented this concept. So, <clears throat> so now this is uh, not so difficult, but we have to do it. So we have to prove both inclusions. So we take a chain of ideals. Um, and um, we, if we assume, so we assume that uh, uh, our, that this one holds. Okay. Now we take a chain of ideals, and uh, we want to show it becomes stationary. So what do we do? We have this chain. We can take i to be just a union. of this. 
Now, it is straightforward to see that this is an idea. You know, because, you know, just think of the definition. You have to show that, um, you know, if you take the sum of any two elements here, then it lies there. That you, if you multiply it by any element in R, it lies there. And you know, the point is, if you have any element here, it already lies in one of these IIs, and therefore, uh, you know, and each of those are ideals. So from that, it follows directly that also the union is an ideal. You know, because they're all contained in each other. So by one, I is finitely generated. So we can write I equal to F1, say to Fk, for some k. But now, so these are some elements in the union here. So each of them must lie in one of the IIs. So each FI lies, no, excuse me, FL lies in uh, I, IL oh, for some IL. Now I can just take let n to be the maximum of the ILs, then we know that all of them lie in IN. Are elements in IN. And so it follows that I is just equal so the idea generated by F1 to, uh, so that I, you know, I therefore is contained in IN, but we know that IN is contained in I, so they are equal. I is equal to IN. And so it follows that from, so therefore, IN is equal to IN plus 1, because I is just the union of all of them. OK, so this is um, one direction. So you can see it's not, you know, you just have to use this, you know, because it's finite. Use the finitely generated to see that you can also here only have finitely many steps. And now the other inclusion is, I think, even is maybe simpler. I don't recall. I think it's slightly simpler. So let we take an idea. So this is two to one. So we want to, sh you know, we have to show that it's finitely generated, and for this we have to make some kind of chain of ideals. Um, and so, so how do we do this? We just we assume it's not finitely generated, and we make an infinite chain of ideals out of this. So assume I is not finitely generated. So then we can take, say, F1 to be an element of I. We can take uh, F2, an element of I, minus the idea generated by F1. And because I is not finitely generated, it's certainly not uh, equal to that. And uh, in inductively, we take uh, Fn plus 1 to be an element, so it's always a non, yeah, an element of I without the ideal generated by F1 to Fn. OK. And then clearly, we have a chain of ideals. F1 is contained and strictly different from F2, F1, F2, because we have the element F2 lies in this and not in this, and so on. So we get an infinite chain 
of ideals, all strictly contained in each other. Okay, so this is the statement. So, so this concept of Noetherian is a Noetherian is a quite important concept in uh, commutative algebra. Somehow, it is the the most important finiteness condition that you want to put on rings. And uh, the point now is that in algebraic geometry, we do have these finiteness conditions because uh, the polynomial ring kx1 to xn is Noetherian, that is Hilbert basis theorem. Okay. We get this as a corollary to an equivalent statement, or no, not equivalent, maybe slightly stronger statement, namely, this is the, this follows from something which one could also call Hilbert's basis theorem, namely, um, let R be an Italian ring, then it follows that if I take a polynomial ring, this is also Noetherian. And why does it follow? Well, because k is Noetherian. No, note k is a Noetherian ring for trivial reasons. Because, for instance, if you talk about, you know, you're here to talk about ideals, you know, K is a field. So a field has very few ideals, namely just the zero ideal and the whole of K. So the only ideals you know, you know that this is true for a field. That the only ideals are the zero ideal and the whole field K. And so certainly, these ideals are finitely generated. This is ideal. This is generated by zero, and this is generated by one. Okay. <clears throat> so we have to prove this second theorem, and in the second formulation, you can see, you can prove it by induction. So proof. Well. Not sure. I, I don't think I will be able to finish it, but at least I maybe can start it a bit. You know, note that by our definition, the polynomial ring in n variables was just defined to be the polynomial in ring in n minus one variables, where we add one more variable. So this is a polynomial. So if now this is the ring of coefficients, and this is a polynomial. So if we, if this is true, so <clears throat> therefore, if we know that R is Noetherian, uh, and we know that if R is Noetherian, then also R is Noetherian if we adjoin a variable X, then it's true for Rx1 to Xn. So thus, enough to prove by induction. If R is Noetherian, then it follows that the polynomial ring Rx is Noetherian. No, this is directly induction. So you would have, you know, Rx1 is Noetherian, then applying it to Rx1, Rx1, X2 is Noetherian, and so on. Anyway, this is just induction. Okay. And we will do an indirect proof. So we assume Rx is not Noetherian and want to show that R is Noetherian.
uh, show uh, R is not material. So this is uh, this requires a trick. So somehow we have to somehow, for instance, assume we have a non-finitely generated ideal here, and we have to find something which is also not finite in a suitable sense in R. So we have to get from go from R x to R, and we do this by looking at the leading coefficient of a polynomial. So somehow, we associate to an ideal here the ideal generated by the leading coefficients of the polynomials, and we will see that uh, this will lead us to a contradiction. So, so let i in Ix be an ideal which is not finitely generated. Then we do something like here. We will always uh, get, uh, this gives us a way to make a chain of ideals. And from this, we will make a chain of the leading coefficients, which will not terminate. So let's see how this works. So let f1 be an element of i, which is non-zero. OK. So we take, uh, say, f2. Uh, an element of i without the ideal generated by f1. Ah, but I forgot something. Um, so such that the degree of f1 is minimal. So every I, every polynomial here has some degree. And now, among all the non-zero polynomials in I1, we take the one, we take one with the smallest possible degrees. So this could be zero or one, but you know, there's only, you know, there's always the smallest possible degree. We take the smallest degree that the elements in I1 can possibly have when they are non-zero. And inductively, Uh, we put, um, we take, say, fn plus 1 to an element in a polynomial in i without the ideal generated by f1 to fn, a polynomial of minimal degree. So we don't just choose any element at this case, like in the previous example, but we always take one with a minimal degree. And this we can always do, because the degree is just some integer, some positive non-negative integer. And there's always, if you have a set of uh, non-negative integers, there's always the smallest one. OK. And we keep track of this, so we say, n i is defined to be the degree of f i. And uh, a i is supposed to be the leading coefficient of f i. So you know the, the highest possible degree that uh, occurs in fi is ni, and the coefficient of x to the ni is ai. That's some non-zero number. So then you notice that you have the following. First, n1 is always smaller or equal to n2, smaller or equal to n3 and so on, because we have always taken f1 to be an element of the lowest possible degree here. Then we take an element, at the next step, we take an element of the lowest possible degree in a smaller set, because we have thrown away these. So each time the 
number of polynomials among we choose to get the lowest degree gets smaller. So therefore, the lowest possible degree can get larger. But it can never get smart, smaller. So we have this. And we can also look at the ideal. So we have A1. The ideal generated by A1 is certainly contained in A1, A2. So we have a chain of ideals. in R. And we want to show that R is not Neutralian by showing that this chain of ideals does not become stationary. So that these inclusions are actually all strict. Okay, let's do it. Now we just, you know, we have already set it up. Now we have to just see if we manage to do this, we have shown that R is not Neutrian. So we have shown our theorem. So assume otherwise. So then at some point, it must be true that two successive ones are equal. Okay. Uh, then for some k, we have that a1 ak is equal to a1 ak plus 1. Okay. So in particular, we have that a k plus 1 is actually an element in the ideal generated by a1 to a k. I want to see that this cannot be possible. So assume we have that. So we can write a k plus 1 as a linear combination of these a i's. So we can write thus, we can write a k plus 1 is equal to the sum i equals 1 to k of, say, what I want to call them. Well, I apparently I want to call them bi times ai, where the bi are some elements of r. OK, why not? Now, <coughs> somehow. Yeah, it would be have some trouble, but anyway. So no, but now we want to we have to go back somehow to Rx and see that this is not possible. So we write down an element G, the polynomial, which is Fk plus one minus the sum I equals one. Okay, bi x to the nk minus ni times fi. Remember, we had these elements fi, of which the ai were the leading coefficients. So let so we define this. So there are two things. First, we have that G is an element in I without F1 to Fk. Because otherwise, we can bring, otherwise bring this to the other side. No? We have that G, we have Fk plus 1 which is just equal to g plus the sum i b i x n k minus n i f i. If this lies in the ideal f1 to f k, then uh, if g does, and these certainly do, so then this would be 
would be in F1 to Fk. Okay. But on the other hand, let's look at uh, the first we can look at the degree of the sums. So we are here. So, so all summons here on this uh, right hand side of G, F degree, N, K, uh -huh. yeah, let me see, I think I want this. Yes, here it's nk plus 1, f degree nk plus 1. Because fi has degree ni, we multiply it by this, so the degree becomes nk plus 1. And this one anyway has degree nk plus 1. So they all have degree nk plus 1. And if you look at the leading term, so the sum of the, just the leading terms. Here it's a k plus one, and here it's some b i e i a i. So this the leading term, the, de, the the term of degree k plus one, of degree n k plus one is actually zero. Is just here a k plus 1 plus the sum i equals 1 to k b i times the leading term of f i. Uh, there's a minus, so it's not plus. So here <coughs> I put a minus. And I know that a k plus 1 is equal to this. So if I take minus, this is 0. So it follows that the degree of g is smaller than nk plus 1. Um, yeah, now that was a bit unfortunate, but, um, but we, this is a contradiction. Because we had chosen um, f k plus 1 as an element of minimal degree in, uh, let me wipe this out, I don't need it, in uh, i without f1 to fk. And here I have found one which has lower degree, namely g. So this is a contradiction. And so this means that uh, everything I said was actually wrong. And uh, so <coughs> uh, the conclusion is that uh, it is not true that the, uh, so it's not true that the chain does not beca become, uh, it is not true that the, the chain became stationary. It is not true that it can happen that these are equal. So it follows that uh, so we have a contradiction. So, so thus, um, the chain does not become stationary. And thus, it follows that R is not Neterian, is not Neterian. So the conclusion is that if Rx is not Neterian, then R is not Neterian. So equivalently, if R is Neterian, then Rx is. Okay. And so this is the 
finishes the proof of the Hilbert basis theorem. So I, sorry, I went slightly over time, but anyway, so this is, uh, I couldn't really very well stop in the middle of it. But anyway, <coughs> so the proof, you know, is a little bit tricky maybe, it takes some effort to follow, but uh, what makes it into a theorem is the fact that it's difficult to think of it. I mean, you know, if, you, if somebody told you try to prove this theorem, or if somebody told me try to prove this theorem, then I would say I have no idea, and uh, that, is, uh, <coughs> that is what makes it into a theorem. Okay, thank you. <laughs>